を殺せよその青き瞳はいずれ貴様から全てを奪い去る These words have fully captivated my interest as a Boruto fan ever since the very start of the series. Because not only is it the biggest overarching conflict in the entire story that brought about a lot of mystery and intrigue for us, it also establishes the biggest theme of Boruto Destiny. Is destiny something for the world to decide, or is it something for you to decide? This question leads the entire dynamic between Boruto and Momoshiki up until the very end of part 1. And as we all saw, the first chapter of Boruto Part 2 had some great character moments and one of the coolest character entrances in the entire series when Boruto showed up stomping on Code's face. However, this theme of destiny has abruptly hit a brick wall. We've lost what's tugged us along thus far, and it all boils down to the timing of the Boruto time skip, which I believe was very problematic and opened a huge missed opportunity. Simply put, The story would be a whole lot better if they had finished the prophecy arc first, and there's an awful lot of reasons for that, and I'll discuss it from both a plot and story perspective. And my word choice is intentional here. I mean it when I say finish this arc first, and I'll break this down later on. However, I acknowledge that this is a very hot take and might seem controversial to a lot of Boruto fans given how much hype and anticipation has gone into the Boruto time skip ever since chapter 1 of the series. So, due to the nature of this video, I have to start off with a quick disclaimer to explain that this is not a Boruto hate video. This is a retroactive analysis from the perspective of a longtime Naruto and Boruto fan. Just because we had the time skip in this chapter doesn't mean that Boruto is bad now, or the world's gonna end, or I'm gonna drop the series. I'm obviously still gonna read every chapter, watch every episode, and keep making Boruto videos because I'm a Boruto fan. It just means that the story will only be a 10 out of 10 instead of a divine 20 out of 10 like it should have been. That's really how I'm looking at it. This isn't a commentary on the first chapter of Boruto Part 2. Putting aside the ending of Part 1, I actually thought this chapter was a pretty good opening for the second part of the story with a lot of really cool moments throughout the chapter. This video is simply a retroactive analysis of Part 1 of Boruto's story, primarily focusing on the conclusion of its final arc. This doesn't mean that Part 2 can't patch up some of the problems in Part 1 and tell an amazing story with amazing themes and conflict. It definitely can, and I don't want you to feel like doing the time skip now has retroactively ruined all of Naruto and Boruto. I just want you to see how much better the story could have been if we had finished this arc before doing a time skip. And before you attack me in the comments and say this is a horrible take and call me a hater, there is a lot to break down, so please be patient with me as I present my case, as by the end of the video you'll understand why I say that the story would have been a lot better if we waited just a little bit longer before doing the time skip. So, without further ado, why do I think doing the time skip right now was such a bad idea? Seriously? <laughs> you asked why? I'll start off easy and progressively get into bigger and bigger problems until I eventually return to the theme of destiny. First of all, there isn't even any actual setup for a time skip. There has been absolutely no indication that Sasuke even plans to train Borto for three years or any specific amount of time in general. He's just gonna train Boruto so he can stop Kawaki, as far as he's aware. Similarly, there's no indication that Kawaki is going to wait three years to try and kill Boruto again, nor is there any reason for him to wait because he's already strong enough to do it now, so waiting would actually be counterproductive, especially since he currently has Mizuki on his side, also trying to kill Boruto. And the longer Kawaki waits around, the greater the chance that people realize the truth of omnipotence and how their memories are a lie, which would then put the target on Kawaki again. And on that same note, Miski is hell bent on killing Boruto right now, and I don't see him just letting it go and waiting for three years. So both Mitsuki and Kawaki should be on Boruto's ass at all times. Now, as for Code, he seems to be ready to enact his plan based off of Chapter 80, but he also has a reason not to invade the Leaf because Aiden and Damon are there. So he's either gonna invade as soon as his army is ready, which might be right now, or he's just not gonna invade until Aiden and Damon are gone somewhere. In either case, Gives him any reason to wait three years specifically to make a move. This greatly differs from Naruto Part 1. Jiraiya learned that Orochimaru had already transferred to a new vessel and could not transfer again for at least three more years, and he also learned that the Akatsuki wouldn't make their move to capture Naruto for three or four more years. And because of that, Jiraiya wanted to make Naruto a full fledged ninja within three years so that he would be ready to face the Akatsuki when they came after him, where they trained for about two and a half years before returning to the village. Our main villains, 
had specific reasons why they weren't going to make their moves for three years, and so Naruto trained with Jiraiya in accordance with that information. There is none of that here in Boruto. We have no setup for why Code, Kawaki, or Mitsuki will wait a few years to make their move, and we have no time frame for how long Boruto plans to train before taking on Kawaki again. In fact, I would argue that the setup is for the characters to make their next move now, not to wait three years first. Let's start with Code. In chapter 77 before the midpoint of the arc, Code is shown sitting down while he watches his Claw Grime army continue to grow, and he tells Buck that he has well over 1000 Claw Grime at this point, including the ones he's storing away, meaning he doesn't plan to use all of his army in the immediate future. He then explains that he'd love to launch an attack on Konoha with them, but Ada's there, so sadly there'd be no element of surprise, implying that Ko does not plan on immediately attacking the Leaf Village with his army. Whatever his plan is, it's not a direct invasion, and he's not going to enact it right now. He's just making preparations for the time being. This is told to us verbally through Code's dialogue, and it's shown to us symbolically by Code sitting down, something you do while waiting or relaxing. But then at the end of chapter 80, Code appears to be standing up as he proclaims that he will kill Boruto for stealing everything he cares about. This implies that Code is about to take some form of action. It doesn't matter what that action actually is, he doesn't necessarily have to be starting his invasion in the Leaf Village or be creating a distraction as part of his invasion strategy. He could just be going to do some scouting near the village to see what everyone is up to, or he could simply be heading back to Boru's hideout to enact the next step of his plan. The point is just that he appears to be planning to do SOMETHING based on the fact that he randomly said he's gonna kill Boruto and now he seems to be standing up rather than sitting based on his posture change being more upright now versus slouched over like it was when he was sitting in chapter 77. Plus the wall behind him appears to be directly to his left now rather than directly behind him like it was in chapter 77. And I doubt he just rotated sideways while sitting. More than likely he stood up based on the artwork which symbolizes that he is done waiting and is now about to take some form of action, whatever that action is. So not only do we have no explanation for what Ko's plan is and why he would need to wait three years specifically, it actually looks as though he's making a move right now. Similarly, Kawaki is also shown standing up in Chapter 80 as he says that it's no use hiding anywhere, he will kill Boruto so long as he's a Suski. Now it's made abundantly clear that Kawaki wants to kill Boruto immediately. He explained to Ada in Chapter 79 that, if they don't take Mamashiki out NOW, Naruto and the Leaf Village will both be destroyed, and he can't let things stay like this because once Mamashiki breaks free, it'll be too late. This is why Kawaki threw such a big fit in Chapter 77 and left to tell Naruto and Hinata his plan to kill Boruto and then sealed them away when they didn't approve, and then he immediately attacked Boruto with the intent to kill in Chapter 78. Kawaki doesn't want to wait around on this, he wants to do it now and Kawaki's dialogue at the end of chapter 80 fits in line with this. And as for Miski, the dude already made his move. The last panel we saw of the guy was him already chasing after Boruto. He's not waiting three years to try and kill Boruto. He's already trying to do that right now. And even when it comes to Boruto, the last thing he says is that he's gonna prove that he's Boruto Uzumaki. And just like Kawaki, Mitsuki, and Code, Boruto is standing up when he says this, implying a call to action. Boruto's not going to sit and wait to do this, he's going to prove his innocence now. So unless he meant that he's going to show Sasuke that he's Boruto Uzumaki until Sasuke is begging him to stop, even though Sasuke heard Boruto and Ada talk about how Ada accidentally used omnipotence to cause Boruto and Kawaki to swap places, and that's how her love charm actually works, it seems as though Boruto wants to show the world that he's Boruto Uzumaki, which he can't exactly do if he hides from the world while he trains with Sasuke. In order for Boruto to show the Leaf Village that he is who he says he is, Boruto has to actually go back to the Leaf Village, where a confrontation with Kawaki and Miski is inevitable. Of course, Boruto clearly plans to get stronger, which will require training with Sasuke, but there's no setup for Boruto to wait three years to return home. It seems like he wants to go back to prove his innocence as soon as he's ready to face Kawaki. So we have Miski and Kawaki, who clearly want to kill Boruto right now. Then we have Code, who also clearly wants to kill Boruto, and appears to be making a move of some sort, and then we have Boruto who wants to prove he's Boruto Uzumaki, which requires him to return to the village in order to accomplish that. I wouldn't call that a time skip setup. That actually sounds like we're setting up another confrontation more than anything else. In addition, the end of Naruto Part 1 also set up who Naruto's classmates would train with and why they wanted to get stronger so badly. Sakura wanted to train with Tsunade, 
so that she wouldn't be dead weight anymore and would be able to help Naruto bring Sasuke back, so she trained under the same time frame as Naruto. Likewise, Orochimaru couldn't take over Sasuke's body for three more years, so he decided to train Sasuke up until that point in order to make his vessel even stronger, and Sasuke went to train with Orochimaru so that he could become strong enough to defeat Itachi, whether that required giving his body up to Orochimaru or not. And this even applies to the other members of the Konoha 12. In Chapter 235, Shikamaru shows his frustration with his incompetence and his father gives him the motivation to improve himself so that he could protect his friends as a leader, and so that next time the mission will go perfectly, instead of being an utter failure. And in Chapter 238, Kiba expresses his desire to become stronger so that he never lets Akamaru experience that pain and suffering ever again. Similarly, Neji was shown training with Hiyashi to improve his vision with the Byakugan, most likely due to how Kitamaru exploited its weakness in their fight. Likewise, Choji was heavily motivated to train with Asuma, most likely, so that he wouldn't have to rely on the Akimichi clan pills again. Rock Lee is also shown training with Guy because he always trains and wouldn't want to fall behind Naruto or Neji. Shino is butthurt about missing out on the Sasuke retrieval mission and would naturally want to get stronger so that he doesn't get left out again. Hinata wanted to work hard and get stronger just like Naruto, and Ino and Tenten naturally wouldn't want to fall behind their highly motivated classmates. Every single member of Naruto's class has a clear motive to get stronger and a specific person to train with. But again, there is none of that here in Boruto. Yeah sure, Mitsuki and Sarada said they wanted to get stronger back in Chapter 69, but Team 7 said they wanted to get stronger back in Chapter 58 too, and every member of Naruto's class wanted to get stronger after the tuning exams before the Sasuke retrieval arc even started. Saying they want to get stronger in some earlier arc doesn't count as a time skip setup. It needs to be in this final arc. And even if we use the Chapter 69 thing, Miski's goals aren't even the same anymore. Now Miski is trying to kill Boruto right now, rather than trying to protect Boruto from Atsuki threats in the future. And Kawaki and Team Shikadai are also currently hunting down Boruto too. Meaning these guys aren't trying to wait three years to train so that they can eventually defeat Boruto. They're all trying to take Boruto down right now. Furthermore, neither Sarada, Miski, nor Kawaki have established how they're going to get stronger. Sure, Miski could go to Orochimaru to train or get modifications, Kawaki could go to Amado to get modifications, or spar with strong people like Damon Code or Sage Miski, and Sarada could train with Kakashi or Sakura, but none of this has been remotely set up whatsoever. Doing a time skip now with this lack of setup for Boruto's friends and enemies would be like if he did the time skip before Naruto and his teammates were brought back to the village, so we would know that Sasuke was training with Orochimaru because that was the whole point of him leaving the village in the first place, but we wouldn't know why everyone waited three years to chase after Sasuke again, or why the Akatsuki didn't do anything because we wouldn't see Jiraiya explain why Orochimaru and the Akatsuki won't make a move for three years, and we wouldn't see that Jiraiya plans to leave the village with Naruto to train him during that time. We wouldn't see Sakura talk to Naruto at the hospital and gain the resolve to grow stronger, so she won't be dead weight next time, and we wouldn't see her ask Tsunade to train her. We wouldn't see Shikamaru talk to Tamari, Tsunade, and Shikaku at the hospital and gain his resolve to grow stronger. We wouldn't see Kiba express his desire to grow stronger so that he can protect Akamaru. We wouldn't see Neji training to improve his Byakugan's vision so that he doesn't almost die again. We wouldn't see Choji wanting to train with Asuma. We wouldn't see Shino but her about missing out on the mission. We wouldn't see Hinata watching Naruto leave and wanting to grow stronger herself. We wouldn't even see Lee training with Guy. This pretty clearly wouldn't be a good time skip setup, but that's exactly what it would be like if you do a time skip right now in Boruto. Sure, we could use our brains to assume that Naruto and Sakura want to grow stronger so that they can bring Sasuke back next time, Jiraiya would want to train Naruto so that he can protect himself from the Akatsuki, and the Sasuke retrieval team would want to grow stronger so that they don't almost die again, just as we can assume Sarada wants to grow stronger to protect Boruto, Mitsuki and Kawaki want to grow stronger so that they can kill Boruto and other Atsuki, and Team Shikadai wants to grow stronger just because, like Ino and Tenten, but this would be significantly less impactful than the way it was actually done in Naruto. And let's not forget about Himawari! We all know that the manga, and especially the anime, have been building up the idea that Himawari will eventually become a ninja, especially since Damon praised her powers so much, and this whole omnipotence in Boruto vs Kawaki situation would be a great catalyst for this. But guess who we haven't seen since Chapter 78 before omnipotence was used? Himawari. Of all the people who should get a moment showing her emotion to everything that just happened and her newfound resolve to become a ninja and grow stronger to save her brothers, Himawari is at the top of that list. 
doing a time skip now with this lack of Himawari could be like if the last time we see Sakura in part 1 is at the end of the search for Tsunade arc when Tsunade heals Sasuke and we just never see Sakura again until after the time skip. So she doesn't see Sasuke's frustration, she doesn't see the rooftop fight between Naruto and Sasuke, she doesn't even know Sasuke left the village to join Orochimaru, she doesn't talk to Sasuke in the middle of the night when he first leaves the village, she doesn't plead to Naruto to bring Sasuke back and Naruto doesn't give her the promise of a lifetime, and Sakura doesn't talk to Naruto at the hospital and realize that she's been dead weight relying on Naruto too much, and she doesn't ask Tsunade to train her so that she can become stronger and come with Naruto next time. None of that happens. That's exactly what this is like with Himawari. Think I'm exaggerating? Himawari doesn't know that Kawaki killed Boruto previously. She hasn't seen Kawaki's growing frustration about the Momoshiki problem. She doesn't know that Kawaki sealed her parents away. She doesn't know that Kawaki is trying to kill Boruto again. She hasn't seen Kawaki fight Boruto and give him a scar. She hasn't seen Kawaki go for the kill against Sarada. She hasn't even seen or spoken to Kawaki in the manga since chapter 60 when they had a family dinner. That's 20 chapters ago, and it's been just over 2 years since that chapter came out. This situation is honestly even worse than the Sakura example I gave. They started setting up Himawari's eventual ninja career in chapter 72, when she thought she could help Boruto out if she became a ninja, and the anime has been slowly building this up for a long time too. So now's the perfect time to double down on that and have Himawari fully commit to becoming a ninja, and this is something that should really happen before the time skip and be shown on screen and in real time. You can't say Himawari's not important here when it directly involves her two brothers, Damon hypes up her crazy power, and she's likely to become a ninja in the future. Obviously she's important here. Even the name of Borto Part 2 might be hinting at Himawari's importance since it's called Borto 2 Blue Vortex, where both Borto and Himawari have blue eyes, and in the Minato manga the vortex was directly linked to the Uzumaki clan sealing jutsu, and there may or may not be a connection here. And if there is any connection here at all, that's all the more reason why Himawari should get some focus before the time skip, alongside Sarada, Mitsuki, and Kawaki. And besides the lack of setup for the time skip, we also have plot points that have been set up to occur before the time skip that haven't been cashed in on yet. A good example is one I mentioned earlier, and that's Amato's shutdown command code on Kawaki. They were clearly building up the idea that Amato would use this to save Kawaki and his master plan at some point. But after Amato explained this plan to Shikamaru, Ada then proceeded to accidentally use omnipotence to manifest Kawaki's desires to alter everyone's memories of Boruto and Kawaki to essentially flip-flop them. And then we never see Amato again. This is not the end of Amato's shutdown code. He's going to use it at some point, and it was foreshadowed that Amato would use it when no one else could oppose Kawaki's power and the implication was that he was going to use it during this arc since Kawaki sealed Naruto away and he was trying to kill Boruto, and he literally told Shikamaru about the shutdown code and his plan to use it. And now that he's told Shikamaru about it, unless Ada's omnipotence erased Shikamaru's memories of that conversation, Shikamaru now knows that Amato can do this and may come to rely on Amato to stop either Boruto or Kawaki depending on how omnipotence affected their memories of Amato's master plan. And if Amato doesn't use this shutdown code right now in a way that benefits the Leaf Village, Shikamaru is going to have major problems with Amato for not revealing this sooner because it makes Amato look shady. Amato can't afford to wait three years to use this shutdown code. He needs to use it now. It doesn't matter if he tries to use it on Boruto or if he tries to use it on Kawaki. He just needs to try and use it on one of them now before it's too late. And not only does this need to happen now from a plot perspective, Amato essentially needs to use the shutdown code before the time skip because it doesn't really work in part 2 after the time skip from a story perspective, and I'll explain this later on during the story structure analysis part of the video. But if Amato doesn't try to use the shutdown code before the time skip, then they probably shouldn't have introduced it in the first place because then it would just be weird. And even worse than the shutdown code problem, we have an event that wasn't just implied to occur before the time skip, it was actually shown occurring before the time skip, and that's the final panel of Boruto's future vision in chapter 75, where Kawaki has the horn and blood on his face and appears to be looking down at Boruto. Kawaki didn't have his horn out or blood on his face when he gave Boruto the scar in chapter 78, so this scene definitely hasn't happened yet, but it needs to happen before the time skip because Kawaki clearly looks the same age in this future vision as he has throughout all of part 1 and he clearly doesn't have the mullet he grows over the time skip yet. 
Kishimoto essentially told the reader that this moment will happen before the time skip, and it will be important. So we can't just not have this scene after it's been hyped up as a big part of Boruto's prophecy. Boruto should either be uneasy about the fact that this moment he foresaw with Kawaki hasn't happened yet, and he should fear that he's not off the hook just yet, or he should be ignorant and unpleasantly surprised when he realizes that he was arrogant for assuming he won this battle, while Momoshiki should realize that he hasn't lost a battle just yet and was actually one step ahead of Boruto the whole time. But if we jump to a time skip right now, then we won't get this internal struggle with Boruto and Momoshiki, which is the overarching conflict in this arc. And the idea that Boruto's future changed from the original one he and Momoshiki saw isn't a good excuse for not showing the scene because neither Boruto nor Momoshiki have commented on the fact that this Kawaki scene hasn't happened yet. We can't just do a time skip without either character mentioning it at least one stinking time. The fact is, they introduced a future event as a major plot point for this specific arc and it hasn't happened yet and no one has brought it up either. To ignore that plot point entirely is simply bad writing. You have to address it somehow, even if it's as cheap as saying, the vision was just wrong. Now, some of you might think we actually did get this Kawaki panel in Chapter 78 when Kawaki fights Boruto and the Hokage stone faces before Omnipotence was even used because there's one panel of Kawaki looking down at Boruto that somewhat resembles the one of Kawaki in the future vision. Sure, these panels do look similar, but Shikamaru also makes the exact same angry face in like 50 different panels throughout Boruto, and Sasuke makes the same suspicious thinking face in like 200 different panels characters are bound to look similar in different panels, but in the case of these Kawaki panels, they are blatantly not identical scenes. In chapter 78, Kawaki doesn't even have his horn out. We don't see any blood on his face. His face is also covered by a shirt in this panel unlike the future vision, and his ninja attack arm is significantly larger because he's currently slamming Boruto with a giant ninja attack hand. Yes, he has the ninja attack arm out in the future vision, but it's like normal sized, as if he just made it into a blade or something. It's not as noticeably large as it was in chapter 78. There's also dialogue in this scene, whereas there wasn't in the future vision of Kawaki. And the other future scenes show dialogue, so there's no reason why they couldn't show text in the Kawaki scene, especially since Kawaki's line is literally the least surprising and least revealing out of all the scenes. Chicken Eye and Mitsuki's lines were far more important in revealing, so Kawaki's dialogue definitely wasn't too important to reveal in the future vision. Now you could say maybe it's just a retcon, but that is such a stupid and pointless retcon to make in the first place. Just draw Kawaki's horn and add some blood and show his face and make his arm a little smaller. There's no reason why Ikimoto can't copy his own drawing. If they wanted this scene to be the exact same scene from the future vision, then all they had to do was draw the exact same scene again like they did for the other scenes from Boruto's future vision. Some of them were shown from different angles, like Mitsuki's for example, but they were all still the exact same scenes with the exact same words, and some of the scenes were shown from identical angles as the future vision. So frankly, I don't think this scene actually happened yet, and calling it a retcon doesn't make me feel any better considering how it wouldn't be a necessary retcon in the first place. And don't you dare say, the anime will fix it. This isn't the anime's plot point or job to fix, it is the manga's plot point. I know the anime likes to add extra scenes and extra arcs in order to flesh out the characters, battles, and story themes, and many times is actually really good. But you need to understand the difference between what we want to happen and what literally needs to happen. We can actually compare this very closely to the end of Naruto. The great Lord Elder Toad Gamamaru had a prophecy about Naruto's future, where Gamamaru's prophecy came from his dreams which were actually visions of the future. Now, his prophecy was that Naruto was going to fight Sasuke in the future, but then Naruto cut him off before he finished the end of his prophecy. Similarly, we had been told about the curse of hatred between Indra and Ashura that destined their reincarnates to continue to fight each other, when Naruto and Sasuke were reincarnates of Indra and Ashura. So Naruto needed to fight Sasuke again by the end of Naruto, or at the very least, they needed to discuss why Gamamaru's prophecy was wrong. The fight didn't need to have emotional dialogue. It didn't need to have emotional flashbacks. It didn't even need to be a good fight. It just needed to happen. Obviously, we wanted it to be amazing, but it didn't need to be. It just needed to either happen or be thoroughly discussed. The situation with Boruto and Kawaki here is almost identical. Just like Gamamaru with Naruto, 
Momoshiki had a prophecy about Boruto based off of a future vision he saw, and Boruto and the audience were shown glimpses of that future vision Momoshiki saw, where part of the vision we saw was that scene with Kawaki. That scene with Kawaki doesn't need to be cool, emotional, or a part of a really amazing fight. It just needs to happen, or they need to discuss why Momoshiki's vision was wrong. This is not the same as the Jogon situation, because the manga has given us absolutely no indication that the Jogon exists or that it will appear before the time skip for any reason whatsoever. The only reason many of us think the Jogon should make an appearance before the time skip is because of everything the anime has done with it so far. But if we only look at the manga, we have no reason to expect anything from it. By contrast, the manga literally told us that this event will happen before the time skip, so we should expect it to happen before the time skip. And in light of this mysterious Kawaki scene, what about a real Boruto vs Kawaki fight? I think most of you would agree that the fight we got in Chapter 78 definitely wasn't the finale we were hoping for. While they occur at different points of the respective arcs, this fight was very reminiscent of Naruto and Sasuke's fight on the hospital rooftop, as both fights were quickly interrupted and neither character went all out. If that had been the final battle between Naruto and Sasuke in Part 1, I think most of us would have been pretty dissatisfied especially knowing how amazing the final battle we actually got was, and we're dancing to the same tune here. All of us were hoping to see a rematch between Boruto and Kawaki, where they both go into their full combo forms with their horns and have an intense, emotional, long drawn out battle on the Hokage stone faces, similar to Naruto and Sasuke's fight at the Valley of the End. Keep in mind that Boruto and Kawaki haven't seen or spoken to each other since Ada used Omnipotence, so we really need them to have a bro moment where Boruto tells Kawaki how he feels and Kawaki tells Boruto how he feels, but they still disagree with each other and let it out in battle, just like Naruto and Sasuke did at the final valley. And all of this could tie into that missing Kawaki panel. But if we have a time skip now, then we're just not going to get what could have been an amazing fight. And it's not just a matter of, oh this could have been a cool fight. From a story perspective, this fight actually needs to happen, and it's about damn time I get into the story structure analysis I alluded to earlier. It's about damn time! I've been waiting, Ashirama! To explain this thoroughly, I'm going to compare this Boruto prophecy arc to other arcs in Naruto Part 1, most notably the Sasuke Retrieval arc since they bear many similarities, and they're both the final arcs of Part 1 of their respective series. Now just about every story follows a general story structure, and Naruto and Boruto are no exceptions, as every arc follows these writing principles and Kishimoto is the author of both stories and obviously knows how story arcs work. Now here's a nice looking diagram to help illustrate what this structure I'm referring to is, and for the purposes of this video we can pretty much ignore everything that happens before the midpoint because there aren't any problems with the first half of this prophecy arc. So the midpoint of this arc is when Kawaki seals Naruto and Hinata away in Daikoku 10. In the eyes of the characters in the story, Kawaki did the unthinkable. He raised his hand against his foster father and mother, the Hokage and his wife, and sealed them in a dimension where they could not escape, and he did this because he plans to kill his brother Boruto, the son of the Hokage. Kawaki's actions shifted the story in a new direction. He literally ended the room sharing mission that was the focus of the first half of the arc, in order to kill his roommate, which became the focus of the second half of the arc, alongside Mamashiki's prophecy. As a result, Kawaki was no longer seen as an ally of the Leaf Village, but instead as an enemy who was targeting Boruto's life, and as a result, Boruto and the Leaf Village would have to face Kawaki to stop him from succeeding, and all of this was related to Mamashiki's sinister prophecy. Mamashiki told Boruto that he would lose everything and that it was going to be a true spectacle, and now Boruto's own brother was taking his parents away from him, signifying the start of Momoshiki's prophecy. The title of chapter 77, Time Drawing Near, also coincides with this as the time that Boruto would lose everything is drawing near just as Momoshiki warned Boruto in chapter 67 and 72. However, Boruto didn't want to believe Momoshiki's warning and refused his call to action because he thought it was a bunch of phony mumbo jumbo, and he had promised to come home to his mother Hinata in chapter 72 when the arc started. But now Boruto was as far away from that goal as he could possibly get, as Hinata was no longer at home for Boruto to return to. All of this is good so far. By comparison, 
The midpoint of the Sasuke retrieval arc is the moment that Kimimaro arrives and takes the coffin holding Sasuke from Naruto and Shikamaru in Naruto Chapter 200. The first half of the arc is mostly about the Sasuke retrieval team chasing after the Sound 4 to take Sasuke's coffin back to the Leaf Village, where they engaged in one-on-one -on -one battles against the Sound 4 in order to continue the mission. And up until the last page of Chapter 200, the Sasuke retrieval team had successfully captured Sasuke's coffin and Shikamaru was going to have Naruto go ahead with the coffin while he faced off against Tayuya so that they could successfully complete the mission. However, Kimimaru's arrival put a wrench in that plan and shifted the story in a new direction. They had almost achieved victory, but now Naruto was as far away as possible from reaching his goal again. And now the second half of this arc would mostly be about Naruto having to face Sasuke himself while his teammates and the Saiyan siblings took on Sakon, Tayuya, and Kimimaru. Now taking a look at the diagram again, the second battle in the Sasuke retrieval arc is when Ninetales enraged Naruto fights Kimimaro with all those shadow clones and ultimately loses. And the final battle, pretty obviously, takes place during Naruto's fight with Sasuke at the Valley of the End, which begins near the end of Act 2 and ends near the end of Act 3, artfully encompassing over a quarter of the entire arc itself. Now by comparison, the second battle in the Prophecy arc is the clash between Boruto and Kawaki and the Hokage Stone Faces, where Kawaki ultimately gives Boruto the scar. In Story Beat 17, the surprise failure or major crisis is when Momoshiki steps in to free Kawaki from Mitsuki, Shikamaru, and Sasuke, which leads into Beat 18 in the second plot point, which is omnipotence where everyone starts to turn on Boruto instead of Kawaki. Now here is where we run into the problem. We entirely skip Beat 19, which is the impossible goal or giving up moment, where the protagonist realizes that their goal may be out of reach and they momentarily give up. Borto didn't do that. He just told Momoshiki, No, you're wrong. I never lost everything. He doesn't doubt himself. He doesn't doubt his goals. He doesn't doubt his future. He just says, Nah, I never lost everything. This greatly differs from Naruto in the Sasuke Retrieval Arc. You could feel Naruto's pain when he realized that Sasuke was completely serious about killing him. Naruto was absolutely devastated, and for a short while, he almost doesn't even really fight back against Sasuke. He's too distracted and heartbroken about the fact that Sasuke is actually trying to kill him right now, until eventually he unleashes Karama's chakra and decides to beat Sasuke to a pulp and drag him back home. But even that isn't working because Sasuke is getting stronger during the fight too, and actually gets ahead of Naruto after unlocking his third Tomoe. Naruto is losing again and he knows it but he just can't accept Sasuke breaking their bond and joining Orochimaru, and so he still forges ahead anyway and uses even more of Kurama's power than ever before. Frankly, Naruto experiences that feeling of doubt and fear of failure several times in this arc, and it always hits you in the feels. There is a reason I express my dissatisfaction with Momoshiki's prophecy and Boruto's reaction in my chapter 80 review. The whole idea of Boruto temporarily falling into despair and almost giving up isn't something I just made up. It's literally a major part of storytelling, and it's something we see all the time in Naruto. I always use this one as an example because I absolutely love this scene so much that it's probably the greatest moment of despair in the entire franchise in the middle of my favorite arc in the franchise, and that's when Naruto gives up all hope versus pain and is about to break the seal on Karama. This scene was so freaking good and impactful. You truly felt Naruto's despair and hopelessness in this moment, and the tragic theme playing in the background in the anime was simply perfect. And it's not until Minato shows up and talks to Naruto that Naruto regains hope and confidence in himself and challenges pain again. Another example is when Naruto fights Gara during the Konoha Crush arc. Naruto was terrified of Gara, not because of his appearance, but because of Gara's reason for living. He fights only for himself and believes his reason for living is simply for the sake of killing others. Naruto doubted himself and wanted to run away at first. He repeatedly questioned if he could really beat someone like Gara, who was basically the epitome of loneliness, and it wasn't until Sasuke planned to sacrifice himself to save his precious comrades that Naruto realized he was wrong about Gara and remembered what true strength is. When he thought about the time, Sasuke jumped in front of Naruto to save him versus Haku, when Kakashi said he never let his comrades die, and when Haku told Naruto that, when people are protecting someone truly precious to them, they truly can become as strong as they must be, and then Naruto pushes forward with this newfound resolve. Comparing these scenes to chapter 80 makes it look really bad if this is really the end of the arc, and it doesn't get any better from here. 
we get a little bit of beat 20 when Boruto regroups with Sasuke and Ada, which is like when Naruto talks to Minato in the pain arc or when he talks to Sasuke in the Konoha crush examples I just talked about. And then we get a singular panel of beat 21, which is when Boruto pushes forward despite the odds and says he'll show the world he's Boruto Uzumaki, which is like when Naruto stares down at pain to face the diva path again, or when Naruto summons 2,000 shadow clones to take on Gara. So if the prophecy arc ended right here at the end of chapter 80 and we jumped to a time skip in chapter 81, then this would literally be an incomplete arc, as we would never get to the final battle or any of beats 22, 23, or 24 for that matter, and we barely did beats 19, 20, or 21 either. Remember how I said earlier that I've never seen a Naruto or Boruto arc with so many loose ends and such little resolution? That's because there is no resolution in this arc and the number of chapters in this arc fit in line with this. The prophecy arc starts in chapter 72, and we know this because Momoshiki tells Boruto that this moment is coming very soon, and that when it happens he'll despair and let Momoshiki take over, but Boruto refuses Momoshiki's call to action, which is very typical for the beginning of an arc. And then the midpoint of the arc occurs at the end of chapter 77 when Kawaki steals Naruto and Hinata away. So if you count 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, and 77, you have six chapters until the midpoint of the arc. Now as you can imagine, the midpoint occurs near the middle of the story. It doesn't have to be exactly in the middle, but it's usually pretty close to it because it's the most sensible place to put the midpoint. However, after the midpoint of this arc, all we have are chapters 78, 79, and 80. Just three chapters. If the midpoint were to be placed right in the middle of the arc, then we would expect the arc to end in chapter 83 or more realistically somewhere between chapters 82 and 85 to give it some wiggle room. Not in chapter 80, that seems too soon. We're 9 chapters into what we should expect to be around a 12 chapter arc. We're only 3 quarters of the way there. Being generous, we've only scratched the surface of act 3 of the arc, which makes sense if the arc is 75% complete. But practically speaking, we'd pretty much be skipping the entire third act of the story arc if the time skip happens right now. That is incredibly strange. It doesn't matter if you think all other Boruto arcs are a perfect 10 out of 10, or if you think they're all mighty trash. There's not a single arc in Naruto that was just incomplete, and there hasn't been a single arc in Boruto so far that was just incomplete. This would be the first time that's ever happened, and it's not something that should ever happen. A lot of beloved Naruto arcs would be pretty bad if we just removed the third act of the arc. Imagine if Kimimaro just died from his illness before Sasuke woke up in Chapter 209, and Naruto just picks Sasuke's coffin up and starts carrying it home to the Leaf Village like he's Santa Claus on Christmas Eve, and says, I'm bringing Sasuke back! Believe it! And meanwhile, Sasuke is dreaming in the coffin about fighting Naruto, but then we just cut to the time skip without actually getting the final battle between Naruto and Sasuke at the Valley of the End. You know, one of the greatest fights in all of Naruto, and one of the greatest arcs in all of Naruto. All that exposition, emotion, character growth, impact, and coolness, just gone. Poof never existed. And even though Sasuke very clearly wants to fight Naruto right now, he is just not going to act upon it for three whole years. As for Choji and Neji who are on their deathbeds and Kiba and Shikamaru who are fighting Sakon and Tayuya, we're just not going to address those loose ends. And as for Kakashi, Sakura, Jiraiya, and Orochimaru's reactions to this ordeal, we're just not going to address that either. Imagine if we started the Naruto vs Sasuke fight, but when Sasuke stabs Naruto with the Chidori at the end of chapter 227, the screen just cuts to black and says Naruto Part 1, The End, and then we jump to a time skip. As for how Choji, Neji, and Naruto survived this ordeal, we're not going to address that. And as for how Choji, Neji, Kiba, Shikamaru, Rock Lee, Naruto, Sakura, Kakashi, and Jiraiya react to this mission failure, and what their next move is, we're just not going to address that either. Oh, in the Akatsuki, we're not going to address what they're doing or why they're waiting to make a move either. Imagine if Naruto stared down at pain after talking to Minato at the end of chapter 440, and then in chapter 441 we randomly cut to the start of the 5 Kage summon arc, and we just never get Naruto and Pain's final clash, in Naruto's conversation with Nagato, and we just don't address how Kakashi, Shizune, and the other people who died came back to life. Imagine if Naruto summoned his 2,000 clones against Gara at the end of chapter 133, and then in chapter 134 we randomly cut to the start of the search for Tsunade arc, when Itachi and Kisame show up in the Leaf Village, and we just don't address how Naruto vs. Gara or Orochimaru vs. Hiruzen concluded. 
Imagine if in the land of Waves arc, Sasuke jumps in front of Naruto to save him from Haku's attack, and Naruto gets mad and unleashes Karaba's chakra at the end of chapter 27. And then in chapter 28, we randomly cut to the start of the tuning exams arc, so we're just left wondering why Sasuke is with Team 7 and not dead, and we don't address how things concluded with Haku and Zabuza. You might think this sounds ridiculous, but that's what Boruto would be doing if it ends this prophecy arc now. Sure, some cool things would still happen in these unfinished arcs like all the Sound 4 fights for example, but the arcs would be significantly worse if you remove the final battle, climax, and resolution. You don't just skip a whole act of the story. In a three-act story which describes the structure of Naruto arcs quite nicely, Act 3 is essentially the payoff for the buildup that occurs in Acts 1 and 2. Without Acts 1 or 2, Act 3 wouldn't be nearly as satisfying or even make much sense because it wouldn't be paying off any buildup since there wouldn't be any in the first place. And without Act 3, all that buildup would be for nothing, simply wasted. And speaking of build-up being wasted for nothing, now's a good time to get into Mobushiki's prophecy. This thing was introduced in Chapter 10 which came out in February of 2017 and has been repeatedly brought up over and over again. We are now at Chapter 80 which came out in April of 2023. That's 70 chapters in 6.5 years of hype and build-up for this prophecy. I'm sorry, but regardless of whether Sarada's Mangekyo Awakening or Mobushiki's intervention with Kawaki changed Boruto's fate or not, if Ada's omnipotence role reversal is all there is to Boruto's prophecy, and Mobushiki's future vision which is blatantly wrong in some parts, that is incredibly disappointing. My disappointment is immeasurable, and my day is ruined. That would probably be the most wasted plot point in the entire franchise. I mean it when I say this would be far worse than what they did to Orushiki and Konohamaru. And it's not because Boruto didn't fall into despair after the role reversal. Frankly, I agree with Borto. I never once considered this as Borto losing everything either. He has all the opportunity in the world to simply regain everything. It's not hard for him to prove his innocence, considering how he looks and acts like Naruto and Himawari, while Kawaki doesn't, and he's in all the Academy, Team 7, and Uzumaki family photos whereas Kawaki isn't. He has Mamoshiki's Karma Seal rather than Kawaki who has Ashiki's reconstructed Karma Seal from Amato, Borto has Sasuke's headband rather than Kawaki, and so on. It's also extra convincing if he doesn't retaliate against the village and has Sasuke, Ada, Damon, Sarada, and Simere all testifying on his behalf. So I didn't want Boruto to cry and lose hope just because of this role reversal thing. I would have been very disappointed in Boruto for not trying to fix his situation given just how many clues he has to prove his case, many of which Sasuke has already pointed out. My problem would be that this is all there was to the prophecy to begin with. It's just very underwhelming given the overwhelming hype Momoshiki gave for it. I want Boruto to have his despair and almost giving up moment like Naruto did in the examples I talked about earlier in the video, but I want this to happen in a way that feels earned. I don't want Boruto's despair to be forced and unnatural. I want the story to force Boruto to despair and force him to grow as a character to overcome that threat and his character flaws. Boruto didn't fight a difficult battle to prevent himself from losing everything like Momoshiki wanted. Nor did he lose everything and then fight to reclaim everything. He just never lost everything in the first place by his own admission, and Momoshiki just said, well crap, now what do I do? And that was it. The final battle aspect of this arc is just completely absent. Not only are we missing the external final battle of Boruto vs Kawaki, we're also missing the internal final battle of Boruto vs Momoshiki's prophecy. In the Sasuke retrieval arc, we had the external final battle of Naruto vs Sasuke, but we also had the internal final battle of Naruto vs his promise of a lifetime to Sakura, and Naruto vs his bond being broken, and these external and internal battles continued until the very end of the series. It was beautifully crafted! Do we not want this type of amazing writing in Boruto for some reason? Now this is just looking at the prophecy at the surface level. Thematically, this is even worse. Destiny is an overarching theme in Boruto just like it was in Naruto, and Momoshiki's prophecy has been an overarching threat throughout part 1 that is directly tied to the overarching theme of destiny. It was introduced in the first arc, and has been repeatedly brought up over and over again, reaching its climax in this final arc of part 1. Momoshiki is the primary overarching villain of part 1 of Boruto, and this prophecy is the embodiment of Momoshiki's will as a villain and antagonistic force. 
he wants Boruto to have a bad fate so that he can take over Boruto's body. And so Boruto has to fight against that bad fate so that Momoshiki doesn't take over his body. Now Boruto utilizes the exact same theme and message about destiny as Naruto. And we know this because Boruto and Naruto both proclaim the exact same thing, which is that destiny is not something for the world to decide, it's something for you to decide. Naruto continuously argued against Neji that fate wasn't something you were resigned to at birth, but rather you could forge your own destiny. And in chapter 104, Genma the Proctor literally thinks to himself that Naruto knows instinctively that believing in yourself can give you the power to change your destiny. Furthermore, Naruto and Sasuke were destined to continue the curse of hatred between Indra and Ashura, but Naruto insisted on ending that curse of hatred by facing Sasuke's hatred head on and overcoming it. Similarly, after Momoshiki reminds Boruto of his fate for the millionth time in chapter 72, Boruto yells, I'll decide my own fate, thank you very much, which is the exact same message Naruto is fighting to prove. Destiny is not something for the world to decide, it's something for you to decide. It's a great theme, so where is the problem then? Let's use the Indra and Ashura prophecy as an example. The curse of hatred between Indra and Ashura is an overarching conflict throughout Naruto that begins in part 1 but is mostly emphasized in part 2. The theme is destiny, but the conflict is the curse of hatred continuing versus Naruto trying to break that curse. Now we're informed of this destiny from several different characters, but the great lord elder Gamamaru is the one who has a literal vision and prophecy about it that he begins to tell Naruto before Naruto cuts him short. Now we don't know how Gamamaru's vision ended since he never finished the prophecy, but we do know that he saw Naruto fighting Sasuke, and other characters such as Obito told us that Naruto and Sasuke were destined to continue that curse of hatred between Indra and Ashura, like all of the other reincarnates. Now Gamamaru's prophecies have canonically never been wrong, but they seem to usually involve two potential outcomes, where the final result is dependent upon a decisive moment along the way. And this was made very apparent with Jiraiya's prophecy, where Jiraiya had to make a critical choice that would determine whether the world headed on the path to stability or destruction. So it's pretty likely that Gamamaru's prophecy for Naruto would have been similar where Naruto would have had to make a choice that would determine whether the curse of hatred would break or continue. But the point is that Naruto and Sasuke were destined to continue the curse of hatred unless Naruto chose to forge a new destiny that broke that curse, which is exactly what he did. So with that in mind, when we look at the conclusion of Boruto's prophecy in chapter 80, it's not portrayed as though Boruto struggled to overcome his tragic destiny by forging a new destiny, it's portrayed as though Momoshiki was just wrong. Boruto never actually had a tragic destiny. He never actually lost everything by his own admission, and I completely agree with Boruto on that part. So now if we took this same concept and applied it to Naruto, it would be as if Gamamaru prophesied that Naruto would fight Sasuke, and Obito, Hakuromo, and Black Setsu all prophesied that Naruto would fight Sasuke and be destined to continue that curse of hatred unless Naruto broke the curse and forged a new destiny like Hakuromo and Gamamaru hoped. But then at the end of Naruto, Naruto and Sasuke just didn't fight because the prophecy and the curse of hatred was just wrong. They were never actually destined to fight each other. Maybe they were never even Indra and Ashura's reincarnates to begin with. They just defeated Kakia and were on completely good terms. Or alternatively, I imagine they all gave Naruto the same prophecy and Naruto and Sasuke still fight at the end of part 2, but then Gamamaru laughs and says, Oh, I'm sorry Naruto, I accidentally gave you Hashirama's prophecy. Yeah, you were actually destined to end the Curse of Hatred the whole time. It was set in stone. You were going to succeed no matter what. In either case, the theme of destiny is still present in the story, but the conflict is effectively diminished because there was never actually any conflict to begin with, because the bad destiny that Naruto was fighting against was just wrong. Remember, the theme is destiny, and the conflict is the Curse of Hatred continuing versus Naruto trying to break that curse. But if the curse just doesn't exist, or at least it doesn't apply to Naruto and Sasuke, then there isn't actually any conflict anymore. A good conflict is what makes a good story. The conclusion and message of Naruto would be significantly less impactful if they had gone this route, and nobody at all would have preferred this alternate ending of Naruto because it's blatantly not as good. To make another comparison with Naruto, a major overarching theme that is present ever since the beginning of Naruto and made very apparent by the Land of Waves arc is what it means to be a shinobi. The world believes that ninja are merely tools that are meant to be used and discarded when they no longer serve their purpose, but Naruto absolutely hates that concept and actively wants to change the world because he believes that ninja are not just tools, they are people and should be treated as people. 
and they should be allowed to have their own dreams and live by their own rules and not simply live and die as tools. Naruto expresses this belief more than once in the arc, most notably in his famous speech to Zabuza that made the demon of the Hidden Mist cry. Naruto actively fights to change the world with his own ninja way for the entire series. Now imagine if the world just didn't treat ninja as tools, and so Naruto didn't have to fight against the world on this point, because there's nothing to fight against. It's just Zabuza and Haku and those two alone who embody this tool philosophy, and Zabuza is just wrong about how he views shinobi. The theme of what it means to be a shinobi is still present, but now there's no conflict between Naruto and the world on this point, and thus it's no longer an overarching theme or overarching conflict throughout the rest of Naruto. Again, good conflict makes a good story. So if you remove an overarching conflict from the story, you're effectively making the story less good than it would have been. Now we can also just look at this from the perspective of the prophecy being hyped up for so long, only to be an annoying disappointment. Imagine if Garamaru's prophecy was just wrong and the endlessly repeating curse of hatred between Indra and Ashura that Obito introduced us to in chapter 462 didn't exist, and so Naruto doesn't even fight Sasuke at the end of the story. Imagine if Gamamaru's prophecy for Jiraiya was just wrong, and none of Jiraiya's students were the child of prophecy, and Jiraiya didn't actually have to make any special choice in order to save the world. Imagine if all that hype about Madara's legendary power was just wrong, and it was actually weaker than Mizuki who Naruto beat in Chapter 1 before he even became a Genin. Imagine if the hype about the Ten Tails power was just wrong, and it was actually weaker than Shukaku. Imagine if the Sage of Six Paths and his legendary Renegon weren't actually strong, and he was weaker than Ebisu. Imagine if the god of Shinobi Hashirama or the generational prodigy Minato were actually by far the weakest Kage in history. Imagine if the clan killer Itachi that Sasuke was so focused on getting revenge against that he was willing to join Orochimaru to gain more power because he thought Itachi was stronger than both Orochimaru and himself was actually super weak and Sasuke was actually plenty strong enough to defeat Itachi after the tuning exams. All of these things would be very annoying because we'd be taking all this hype and dumping it down the drain. If you're gonna hype something up in the story, you need to deliver on that hype, or else it's just gonna be disappointing. Now thematics and undelivered hype aside, this prophecy conclusion also poses several problems for Momoshiki as a villain. The way things ended in Chapter 80, Momoshiki was just wrong and didn't get what he wanted. So if this is the end of Momoshiki before the time skip, then it sets really low expectations for Momoshiki as a villain in part 2. The dude took the biggest L in the series even worse than Code's L vs Damon. After all that hype for Borto's terrible prophecy, Momoshiki wasn't just wrong, he was only wrong, and he loses miserably. That doesn't make Momoshiki look like a threat during the time skip, we're just gonna think the dude is weak and a loser and can't take over Borto's body. Because his karma is no longer extracting anymore, it's highly unlikely that Momoshiki will have better luck taking over Boruto as he gets older and stronger, both physically and mentally if he's already having this much trouble now. It's not the same as with Naruto and Kurama because more and more of Kurama's chakra was progressively leaking out of Minato's seal, whereas that's not the case for Momoshiki. His power isn't increasing, it's completely stalled. As a result, Momoshiki's not a rising threat anymore, he's a diminished threat. If he doesn't make a comeback now, then he will lose all respect as a villain. It's not the same as Code because Code has been built up as a powerful villain who's been taking losses but coming back stronger each and every time. First he loses to Momoshiki and Kawaki, then he powers up by getting his limiters removed, then he loses to Daemon, and now he's created a massive Ten Tails Claw Grime army and plans to make his next move at some unknown point. Momoshiki on the other hand isn't shown coming back stronger than ever before in order to strike back at Boruto. He just loses and he loses miserably. It's pitiful. And if the threat of Momoshiki has effectively been reduced to a whining brat with nothing to replace the threat he was before, we have effectively reduced the amount of conflict in the story. And as I've said plenty of times by now, good conflict makes a good story. Momoshiki was one of the best villains providing some of the best conflict in Boruto Part 1, but ending things this way really puts a damper on that. It's just not a good way to end things with Momoshiki before the time skip. The only way to save Momoshiki's standing as a villain is to continue the events in the present time and have Momoshiki gain the upper hand before we hit the time skip. And that's actually a great segue into the next point, which is that the midpoint of a story is always a failure or a false victory that shifts the story in a new direction. In the case of Naruto, the midpoint was the end of part 1 where Naruto failed to bring Sasuke back. 
and if Boruto is a two-part story like Naruto, then the end of part one will be the midpoint of Boruto's story just like Naruto's. But Boruto hasn't really experienced a failure, as he just told Momoshiki, No, I didn't lose, and that was the end of Momoshiki's prophecy. Now you could consider it a false victory, but that false victory is usually revealed as a false victory at the midpoint itself, or at least very soon afterwards, where we see that the antagonist was one step ahead of the protagonist the whole time. Not three years later after a time skip. That would be very strange for the midpoint of the Boruto story. But if we wait to have a time skip and have a Boruto vs. Kawaki rematch where Boruto experiences a great loss related to Kawaki and or Momoshiki's prophecy, then that's a lot more fitting for the midpoint of Boruto's story. And given that Mabushiki was the overarching villain of Part 1 and is facing a devastating loss at the end of Part 1, the midpoint of the overall story, that that almost makes it seem like he's the protagonist who will succeed at the end of Part 2, which we know is just incredibly unlikely to be the case, so this is just strange. It's fine for Mabushiki to face some sort of loss, but he should also achieve some sort of victory. To make a comparison with Orochimaru, who was an overarching villain in Part 1 of Naruto, Orochimaru faced a loss in that Sasuke did not arrive at his hideout in time for Orochimaru to take his body, forcing Orochimaru to use another vessel and have to wait three years before he could take Sasuke's body. However, he did still achieve a victory in that Sasuke successfully came to Orochimaru in search of power like he predicted. So Orochimaru didn't achieve everything he wanted, but he was still in the picture as a major looming threat over the time skip. So if he were to do something similar with Momoshiki and Boruto, Momoshiki could face a loss in that Boruto just doesn't lose everything and despair the way he expected him to, but Boruto could still face a heavy loss that really breaks his heart considerably, either due to Kawaki or Momoshiki himself, which would allow Momoshiki to stay in the picture as a major looming threat over the time skip. This effectively increases both the quantity and the quality of the conflict, on both an external and an internal level, and thus would improve the ending of this arc and set a better foundation for the beginning of the next arc after the time skip. Furthermore, I haven't forgotten about Amato's shutdown code that I mentioned like an hour ago by now. If the arc continues like it should, then Amato's shutdown code might play a key role in the resolution of this arc. The reason I say that is because if Boruto faces Kawaki again in the near future, there is a very high probability that he will lose that battle just like Naruto did with Sasuke, because the midpoint of a story is always a failure or false victory of some sort that shifts the story in a new direction. If Boruto defeated Kawaki, that that wouldn't be a failure nor a false victory. It would simply be a victory, and it wouldn't shift the story in a new direction. It would just keep the story in a weird situation where Boruto won but Kawaki probably still wants to kill Boruto anyway, based off the flash forward scene where Boruto and Kawaki are still at odds with each other. However, if Boruto cannot defeat Kawaki, then he's gonna have a hard time avoiding being killed by Kawaki, which we know doesn't happen since Boruto is still alive in the future. Because of this, there's only a handful of ways he can get out of this situation, and one of them could be for Amato to shut Kawaki down like he originally planned to do in Chapter 79. It would also add to the mysteriousness of Amato and what he plans to do next, which would be nice considering the last panel we saw of Amato was just him yelling Shikamaru's name, which isn't exactly the greatest ending for one of the best antagonists in Boruto so far. Now of course Amato's shutdown code isn't the only way Boruto could get out of a losing situation versus Kawaki. Momoshiki, Mitsuki, Sarada, Sasuke, Ada, or Damon could also play a role, but I do think Boruto should face a loss versus Kawaki in a Momoshiki's prophecy, and the best resolution to Kawaki not killing Boruto that feels the least like a win for Boruto is Amato's shutdown code or Momoshiki's intervention in my opinion. Anything else takes away from the loss too much and makes us feel like a victory instead. Now the next point I want to make is more so my opinion that it is something I think necessarily needs to be the case, and it has to do with thematics again. I've said for a long time that it's been hinted at ever since Chapter 1 that Boruto Part 1 is the story of Boruto and his dad Naruto, whereas Part 2 will just be Boruto's story, and this would be symbolized by Kawaki sending Naruto away near the end of Part 1. And even the name of Boruto Part 2 represents this by not including Naruto in the name. Rather than saying Boruto, Naruto Next Generations like with Part 1, now it's just Boruto, Two Blue Vortex, and that's because Naruto literally isn't present in the story at the moment, and probably won't return for a long time because Kawaki is keeping him trapped in Daikoku Ten. Now with that in mind, if Boruto Part 2 is supposed to signify the beginning of Boruto's story, rather than the story of both Naruto and Boruto, then I find it odd that the final chapter and plot point of Part 1 is Boruto saying he's gonna do what his dad did, rather than saying this is his story and that'll do his own thing like he did in Chapter 1 and Chapter 10. 
they are giving mixed signals here in my opinion. And that could be because Boruto is not going to fully dive into his own path for a few more chapters, which in my opinion is when the time skip should occur. I think the time skip should occur when Boruto takes his own path rather than following in Naruto's footsteps. And the reason why Boruto changes paths could be related to that Kawaki panel we have still yet to see play out in real time. This is just my opinion and you're welcome to disagree with it, but I'm not bringing it up just because I think it would be good writing to have the time skip occur when Boruto forges his own path. I also genuinely believe that it just makes sense with what they foreshadowed in the first chapter and with the titles of parts 1 and 2. Thematically, it just makes more sense to me. Now the next two things I want to bring up are loose ends that are also related to the Destiny theme I spoke about earlier, and that's the Jogan and Kashin Koji. I intentionally didn't include these two in the loose ends section at the beginning of the video, and instead saved them for towards the end here because they don't actually need to be addressed here in part 1 because there's no indication that they will be addressed in part 1 for any reason. I just think they should be. They went out of their way to have Ashiki proclaim that, Oh jeez, all people have a predestined fate. Ashin Koji, clone of Jiraiya the Great Three, that you shall die here, was also predestined by your genes. Now, Ashiki said this because Jiraiya died in his fight against pain, and since Kashin Koji possesses Jiraiya's genes, which Ashiki believes to have a predestined fate, he assumed that Kashin Koji would die the same way that Jiraiya did. However, Kashin Koji proceeded to not die against the Shiki and was able to escape instead, supporting the message that destiny is not something for the world to decide, it's something for you to decide, just like Naruto taught us. However, we haven't seen Kashin Koji since chapter 48 when he escaped from Ashiki. That was 32 chapters ago. It's been 3 years and 1 month since we've seen this dude. We don't necessarily need to see Kashin Koji before the time skip, but I do think it would be nice to get at least one panel of the guy and maybe some hint as to what he plans to do next. Now as for the Jogan, the manga has given us absolutely no reason to assume it will appear at any point of the story at all, but since the anime went out of its way to do a bunch of things with the Jogan, now it's just kind of weird if Boruto never activates or even mentions the existence of the Zai at any point in part 1, and instead just randomly activates it in part 2. The absolute worst thing they could do is have Borto return from the time skip having some mastery over the Jogon, where they didn't even mention the eye in part 1 whatsoever. It's already weird enough as it is because Borto has used the Jogon on more than one occasion and he knows he has this eye because he thought it was Byakugan at first, and when he fought against Urashiki he realized that he felt the same sensation of his Jogon awakening before, and Urashiki literally tells him, that looks like the Jogon, and Shiki was right there to see it. The fact that Boruto hasn't brought this up to Naruto or Sasuke in the anime or the manga is already weird enough. At least throw it in the manga so we can start building it up already. It would actually make a pretty good cliffhanger mystery. And the reason I related to the Destiny theme is because Toneri gave Boruto a very different prophecy from Mobushiki's that involved Boruto shouldering the fate of the world with his Jogan Eye that is the Star of Hope. So if we're gonna tie the Jogan into the Destiny theme that is present in Part 1 of Boruto, I think that Jogan should be formally introduced in the manga before the time skip, even if it's very vague and mysterious. Just something. Imagine if Naruto just never used the Ninetales Chakra at any point in part 1 of the manga, and no character ever makes any mention of the fact that the Ninetales even exists or that it's inside Naruto, while well, the anime kept all the Ninetales stuff we know and love. And then in part 2, Naruto randomly starts using the Ninetales power out of nowhere. The disparity between the manga and the anime would be really odd, and the random invocation of the Night Tales so late into the story just wouldn't be as cool or impactful as it was originally, especially in light of all the other aspects of the Night Tales in Naruto besides just his power in battle. It's also part of Naruto's sad backstory and how he relates to so many different villains. So while the Jogan and Kashi Koji don't need to appear before the time skip, I still think it would be better if they did. Now, I'm sure a lot of you will say that Naruto has a million flashbacks, so we can always have these moments I've talked about in a flashback too. But there's a major difference between most of Naruto's flashbacks for what this type of flashback would be. The vast majority of flashbacks in Naruto are events that occurred before chapter or episode 1 when Naruto graduates from the academy. The backstories of Gara, Nagato, Obito, Kakashi, Madara, Hajirama, Sasuke, Naruto, Itachi, and so on are not events that could have been shown in the present because they already happened before the start of the series. Alternatively, many other flashbacks were things we've already seen in the story and were included to remind us of those events because they were important to one or more of the characters. This is not the same thing as skipping over an important event in the present so that we could show it later on as a flashback. 
that is completely different and undermines a lot of the intensity those scenes could have had otherwise. That's not to say that this never once happened in Naruto, but it happened very sparingly. The only four times this happened I can think of off the top of my head are when Jiraiya told Naruto they would be training to make a giant Rasengan, when Naruto remembers his Genjutsu resistance training with Jiraiya, when Jiraiya almost died after being attacked by Four Tails Naruto, and when Sakura was training to evade Tsunade's attacks. All of which specifically happened during Naruto's time skip training with Jiraiya, or Sakura's time skip training with Tsunade. Now the big difference here is that these events didn't have the same in the moment intensity that these Boruto events would have. The Genjutsu, Giant Rasengan, and Evasion training really weren't anything super crazy, and the Four Tails situation was actually not the main intense Nine Tails moment, but instead was meant to serve as build up for later on when Naruto went Four Tails mode against Orochimaru and hurt Sakura, and when he almost completely unleashed the Nine Tails against Pain. These loose ends in Boruto are not the same. I'm not saying it would be problematic if we skip over Boruto training with Sasuke over the time skip, and then flash back to a few specific moments of their training. I'm talking about skipping over major events that need to happen before the time skip takes place to begin with. I already gave you plenty of Sasuke retrieval art comparisons earlier in the video. Imagine if all the time skips set up in the Naruto vs Sasuke battle at the final valley were all shown to us in a flashback near the beginning of part 2. So we already know that Naruto failed to bring Sasuke back, so we already know he loses the fight we're gonna see in this flashback. The intensity of the moment would be greatly reduced. It just wouldn't hit the same. None of you would have preferred that we skip over the Naruto vs Sasuke fight so we can rush to a time skip and just show the fight in a flashback. None of you would have preferred that all the time skips set up in last third of the entire Sasuke retrieval arc was skipped over and shown in a flashback after the time skip. Why? Because that just wouldn't be as good. You wanted to see the arc play out in the moment and there's a reason for that. It's simply better that way. I mean just think about it logically for a second. If these events are so important that we absolutely need to show them in a flashback at the beginning of the time skip because we skipped over them, then why are we skipping over them in the first place? For what reason would we not want to just show them in real time when we're literally at that point in time in the story right now? That just doesn't make any sense. The only difference between Boruto Part 1 and Naruto Part 1 here is that we had a flash forward scene showing the Boruto time skip in the first chapter, so we knew from the beginning of the series that there would eventually be a time skip at some point. Whereas at the beginning of Naruto, we have no idea that there's necessarily going to be a time skip. We just got clickbaited into the time skip hype and fans have been waiting for it for so long that they're grasping at straws so that we can get the time skip now because it's hype and people like hype things. But if we wait on the time skip, not only will we get one or two hype, cool, emotional, and impactful fights involving Boruto and Kawaki, and maybe even Mitsuki and Sarada too, these fights and their repercussions will also make the time skip that much more hype when it actually comes. So I honestly think you'll get more hypeness by waiting on the time skip versus rushing into it now. I mean, the fact that I could come up with like 200 points against doing the time skip now from every perspective possible as a fan of Boruto just outlines the problem. The story would simply be better if we just wait. That's all there is to it. Now even after listening to everything I've explained so far, I'm sure someone is still thinking, but Kamui, doing the time skip now will be good because of this or that. So now I want to address why so many people are hell bent on having a time skip right now in the first place, and explain why I think these reasons are misguided. So one popular reason why people want a time skip now is because they want Borto's generation to get a lot stronger and have cool new abilities. Now I get that a lot of people honestly just care about the cool flashy fights more than anything else and that's why they like this genre of anime and manga, but here's the thing. First off, most of Boruto's generation is anime only, so we don't even need to include them in this manga discussion. As for Team Shikadai, they are such backseat characters that they are just as likely to show up with a new Jutsu in a random arc as they are in a time skip. We've barely seen anything from Shikadai, so we could have learned the Shadow Strangle Jutsu at literally any point, just as Shikamaru learned it after the tuning exams and before the Sasuke Retrieval Art. And looking at the Konoha 12 in Naruto, yes everyone got stronger, but not by some mind-blowing degree. Shikamaru learned the Shadow Stitching Technique, Neji learned Air Palm, Hinata learned the Twin Lion Fist that she used against Pain, and nobody else really showed anything new into the war arc, but they were implied to have learned those new abilities more recently. And as for Team 7, yes they can get a lot stronger and learn some new abilities, but the most important abilities they learn are going to be shown on screen. For example, Naruto barely had any new Jutsu or tricks after the time skip. 
He just learned how to make a giant Rasengan gun and was tapping into more of Kurama's power now. Things like the Ross and Jurikin, Sage Mode, Befriending Kurama, and so on, were all things we had to see on screen because they were too important. Sakura made tremendous progress in medical ninjutsu and learned Tsunade's chakra enhanced punches and kicks technique, but something like the 100 healings and mitotic regeneration was too big to have her acquire off screen. She was training for it, but she didn't master it yet. As for Sasuke, I'll admit he did get pretty busted over the time skip, but we didn't actually get to see all of his tricks until pretty far into the time skip, and the progression of his Sharing Gun was the most important upgrade and had to happen on screen. So when it comes to Boruto, for example, the only thing we're likely to see him learn over the time skip is some new cool lightning style or wind style jutsu or something. They might be pretty cool, but they're probably not going to be some revolutionary techniques. We're most likely not going to see him show up having mastered his Jogun, because we haven't even been properly introduced to it in the manga, so it would be very annoying to see that mastered off screen. And a lot of times we see characters make great strides in power or intelligence during the middle of important fights, such as when Sasuke awakened his third Tumbleye versus Naruto, and Naruto first uses one tail cloak versus Sasuke. Boruto will probably awaken and progress his Jogun during the middle of important fights, rather than off screen. So in my opinion, it would be far more impactful to see Boruto, Sarada, Mitsuki, and or Kawaki get stronger or advance to Dojutsu during an important battle at the end of part 1, and then learn some more new skills over the time skip, rather than just showing up with a bunch of ridiculous techniques they exclusively learned off screen. In addition, another popular reason is that people want the characters to become cooler and more mature. Boruto is a great example of this. We know that his goal is to become a ninja like Sasuke, and at some point he's going to take up that mantle. And when he does so, he's bound to become a bit cooler and darker and less goofy and cheerful, like his father Naruto. And I totally get the sentiment for why you would want this to happen, because who doesn't like cool characters? It is pretty likely that Boruto, Sarada, Mizuki, and Kawaki all might return from the time skip being a bit cooler than they were before as they aged and matured. However, the reason why these characters undergo these changes and become more mature isn't just because they grew older. It's because of their experiences which naturally add up as they get older. For example, Naruto matured an incredible amount during the Pain arc. This did not happen because he was 16. It's because of everything Pain did in that arc. If Pain didn't kill Jiraiya, destroy his village, and talk about peace, Naruto is not remotely thinking about peace at all, and he even admits that he wasn't really paying attention when Jiraiya talked about it in the past. He's only thinking about it now because Jiraiya is dead and he wants to carry out his master's dream, and also because Pain is literally talking about that same dream. Likewise, if Pain didn't give Naruto the cycle of hatred speech and ask Naruto what his answer to peace was, Naruto would not have realized that he was naive and didn't have an answer to peace, and he wouldn't have wanted to talk to Nagato and learn his backstory, and he wouldn't have come to the same conclusion that he did at the end of the arc. Naruto admitted that he still hated Nagato for what he did, but he wouldn't seek revenge against him because that would just be proving Nagato's whole point correct. Pain is the one who changed Naruto, not age. Of course if Pain had done all this when Naruto was 12, Naruto wouldn't have responded the same because he would be younger and more immature, but it is primarily the experience Naruto went through with Pain that caused this growth while age was just a secondary factor. Sasuke is another great example of this. Sasuke didn't undergo his many changes in goals and ideologies just because he got older. He went through these changes because of the experiences he went through and the information that was given to him. Sasuke went through many radical changes throughout Naruto at various ages. He first adopted his revenge goal as a kid after Itachi massacred their clan. Then he started to live a happier life with Team 7 until Orochimaru showed up and reminded Sasuke of his goal and his weakness and gave him a new source of power. Then Sasuke witnessed Naruto's immense progress as he surpassed Sasuke which angered him. And then when Itachi and the Sound Force showed up, they reminded Sasuke of his purpose again, and he underwent a change where revenge now became his only thought and only goal, where he even developed the ideology that he needed to break his bonds in order to become stronger, thus causing a major rift between him and Naruto. And then he learns the truth about Itachi later on, and shifts his focus to revenge on the Leaf Village, then he speaks to Edo Itachi in the Edo Hokage and develops a new revolutionary ideology, then he loses to Naruto and decides to believe in Naruto's ideals. So Sasuke underwent major changes in both Part 1 and Part 2, and none of these changes occurred during the time skip. Why? Because they're too important to happen off screen. All of Naruto, Sasuke, and every other character's major changes needed to occur on screen because that's how you write a good story. 
The Sasuke we see at the beginning of Shippuden is a direct result of Sasuke's experiences in the second half of part 1. Now when it comes to Boruto, he has a pretty similar goofy, happy, and friendly personality like Naruto's, and with the way things left off in chapter 80, Boruto would be starting the time skip with that same Naruto-like personality that he currently has. Just because Boruto trains with Sasuke doesn't mean he's going to be like Sasuke. For example, Sasuke already possessed that same calm and cool nature that Orochimaru possessed as a kid, but Sasuke did not remotely become twisted and Orochimaru-like in personality or goals after training with him for three years. Sasuke kept the exact same personality and goals he had before training with Orochimaru. He simply got stronger and learned various new jutsu under Orochimaru's tutelage. Similarly, Naruto was already very goofy and a little bit pervy like Jiraiya as Naruto had already invented the sexy jutsu long before he even met Jiraiya. But Naruto did not become anywhere near as pervy as Jiraiya after training with him for three years. Naruto kept the exact same personality and goals he had before training with Jiraiya. He just got stronger and learned some new tricks and became a little bit more mature with age. Likewise, Sakura was already very Tsunade-like in personality, but she never picked up Tsunade's gambling or drinking habits after training with her for three years. She just got stronger, more confident in herself, and learned many of Tsunade's abilities. Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura were already similar to their masters in certain aspects, but they never became drastically more like their masters in personality after training with them. They just kept the same similarities they already had and kept the same differences they already had. By contrast, Boruto isn't really like Sasuke in personality right now, and he's already trained with Sasuke quite a bit, but his personality never became more like Sasuke's. He just learned the jutsu and tricks Sasuke taught him, and this would most likely remain the case even if Boruto trained with Sasuke for 3 years. The only way Boruto is going to dramatically change to be like Sasuke is if he experiences a tragic event that causes a major change in his personality, mindset, and goals, just as was the case for Naruto and Sasuke. So if you want Boruto to have already underwent this change by the start of the time skip, then he needs to experience that major event before the time skip, which can only happen if we continue with the present for a little bit longer since that major personality changing event clearly hasn't happened yet, and we definitely don't want it to just happen off screen. Now the biggest reason a lot of people want a time skip right now is because they don't like where the story is going right now and they want the story to head into a new direction, where the time skip feels like a good place to hit the reset button. Unfortunately though, this logic doesn't fully make sense because the end of part 1 is largely what sets up the direction of the beginning of part 2 just like it did with Naruto. The direction the story is going is based off of what just happened in chapter 80. So if you don't like that direction, the last thing you want is a time skip now or else we're probably going to keep going in that same direction. If you want the start of the time skip to take a new route, you'd actually need to continue the story at the current time so that you can set up a new route for the time skip and this is actually what will most likely happen if the story continues in the present. On a similar note, a lot of people expect the story to get better if you have a time skip now. But the truth is, the quality of the story has nothing to do with the age of the characters. It's just good or bad because the story itself is good or bad. Kishimoto was cooking throughout all of Naruto. The story was good in both Part 1 and Part 2, and a lot of people including myself think Part 1 has some of the best arcs in Naruto overall such as the Land of Waves, tuning exams, and Sasuke Retrieval Arcs. Now when it comes to Boruto, I hold the same sentiment of wanting Part 2 to be better than Part 1 has been, but that doesn't mean the story can't get better if there's no time skip now, and likewise it doesn't mean the story will get better if there is a time skip now. It's not like Kishimoto's just sitting there like, okay, all the good stuff will happen in Part 2, so the question is, when should I end Part 1? If that was the case, he would have just skipped to Part 2 to begin with he wouldn't have let Kodachi start with Part 1. He would have just made him skip to Part 2. And come on guys, just because the characters get older doesn't mean the story is magically going to get better. We should be hoping for Boruto to be a divine 10 out of 10 at all points of the story, not just after the time skip. And by this point, you already know my stance on this. I think the story will be unnecessarily less good than it could have been if we have a time skip now, whereas the story will be straight up better if we wait a few chapters. It's fine to be hyped about the time skip, but both you and Kishimoto should really just be patient. It's not worth reducing the quality of part 1 just so the characters can become cooler and get some power-ups in part 2. To be honest, if it didn't feel like they were randomly trying to shove in a time skip in the last 5 pages of chapter 80 while they then proceeded to go on hiatus and then say part 1 was over in the volume 20 release, 
and then reveal a new Sarda design and announce the title for Boruto Part 2, which will start when Boruto comes back in August, and then show Boruto's timeskip design on V-Jump's October issue cover. I never would have felt inclined to make this video, and I never would have even considered that we'd be getting a timeskip right now, in light of everything I've rambled on about over the last hour and a half or so. And if the timeskip is already confirmed by the time this video is out, then gosh darn it I wish that didn't happen, and hopefully you see why, but I want to hear what you guys think. Even after all my disclaimers at the start of the video, I still expect a fair share of angry comments, but I imagine anyone still watching can at the very least understand where I'm coming from. So what do you think about the time skip happening in chapter 81? Do you think it would be bad like me, or do you still think it would be better to do it now instead of finishing the arc first? Let me know in the comment section below, and I also want to give a special shout out to my friend Udi on my podcast channel for discussing a lot of the narrative stuff with me, as he is a screenwriter and I want to get his opinion on some of the writing structure stuff. And you should check out our podcast to see me, Tripping, and Udi discuss a lot of fun topics. But that's a wrap on today's insanely long ass video, so thank you guys for watching until the end. You're already under my Genjutsu. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a comment, like the video, check out my podcast channel, become a member, and hit the bell icon for notifications. Sorry, Sasuke. Maybe some other time. Have a great rest of your day, and I'll catch you guys next time. Bye.